pour moi, pour a certain type of characteristic equilibrium time, uh, infusive cell, it gives us an idea of uh, how how things uh, work. And now I wanted to be direct about uh, some of uh, climate and tectonics in a mountain range. And I have, so I have this slide on, on paper, I think good and emblematic of, uh, of, those, uh, of those aspects. So how climate and tectonics can propagate in a mountain range. And, and with Jean, you can definitely uh, look at this with numerical models. You uh, responded to my question about MATLAB. And, and so I don't think it's needed uh, to do a, the, the MATLAB exercise. Uh, you do largely enough, but if you want another time or when we are on the field, I can I can just show you a, a simple, super simple 1D code for, for a stream power law in which we can see the qualitative difference between doubling uplift and doubling uh, rainfall. Uh, I have some general things about uh, signal propagation, okay? And I should finish with gains and limitations of the source to sink approach. So here I wanted to share those uh, those two papers, um, and you 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 do have the the title um, landscape response to climate change, and this is from an experimental modeling perspective. That's a paper by Stefan Bonnet and Alain Crave, and you see this is. From, it's not from 2015, it's from 2003, I think. I don't have the, the date. Uh, I just downloaded it in, uh, in 2015, but uh, it's just the date of this download. Um, and Stéphane Bonnet and Alain Crave were in Geosciences Rennes, where François and Cécile uh, uh, are, are sitting. Um, and so that's where I also did my, uh, my PhD at the time in, in 2003. And at that time, uh, Stéphane Bonnet, Alain Crave, uh, and others, they, they, they were fully into those, uh, those, those topics, uh, following up, uh, you know, that's, that's when really the, the tectonic geomorphology uh, exploded kind of as a topic of, uh, of research and, and really became uh, prominent. And so what they did is uh, because Geoscience, Geoscience Rennes has a long, long tradition of being uh, analog models. We also call them analog models or, or laboratory physical models. They have um, a little uh, box of 20 centimeter by maybe 10 uh, or maybe 15. It's, it's rectangular. And is uh, here, here they cut everything outside. You don't see the experimental apparatus, but this this box is filled with um, it's like a shoebox, wanted, and it's filled with some sort of mix of silica, um, and it's wet, and and there is a depth that you don't see where there is another 15 centimeters of uh, of this silica. Uh, uh, if you want, and, and there's an engine pushes such that the the the, the, the pate of, of silica goes up with time at a fixed rate, and edges okay walls on the side, and so they put this box into a bigger box in which they produce some kind of fog to simulate rainfall. So they, they worked a lot on, on you know, finding the right sprinklers that could, do, that, could, that could do the right size of droplets. Because if you don't look, if you don't take care about this, you end up with big droplets uh, that creates craters everywhere on your surface. And it doesn't look at all like real uh, landscape. Mm. But they found right, really fine tuning um, to make a really a fog with very, very small uh, droplets of water. Um, and as you can see, progressively, this, this becomes like a plateau with erosion on the side. You develop a symmetrical 
uh, topography with uh, two long sides and, uh, and two short here and a right here. And so this topography can be looked at uh, as an uplifting uh, topography and an uplifting uh, mountain range, but 20 centimeters. And here in this plot, they show with time in minutes, the elevation, the elevation and the elevation. So this is the mean elevation. They could, uh, yeah, sorry, they could, this, this box was, so the fog box is fixed and the silica putty is on a trailer such that you can pull it out of the fog box periodically and scan the surface to look at topography. So these are not pictures, these are full DEMs, uh, digital elevation models of the topography that can then be analyzed. And so what they show here is the mean elevation with time, the elevation with time. And this here is the rainfall rate. You see the rainfall rate is about um, 100 something, 125 millimeter, 137 millimeter per year. Okay. Of course, this is very, I mean, in, in nature, this will be very arid. As far as, uh, as uh, an, an analog element, this is super humid, but uh, this is to accelerate erosion in this, in this box. It's not totally, they measure it, you know, they put a glass and they can measure it because if you, if you put a, a glass, graduated the glass in the, in the fog box, you can measure how much rain actually fall on the face because tap water to the, 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 the water network to which the, the sprinkler system is connected is, is not totally constant. So if you do little experiments in a lab, you realize that you know, the, the, the water going out of the tap is actually not coming out in a constant way. This is due to But so basically it's, 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 a great, um, it's a great setting because unlike real mountain ranges, here we know uplift, we know climate, and we can measure elevation with time. So it's a fully, what we call a controlled experiment, exactly like in numerical models. What is seen here is cre clearly the, the progressive evolution of mean and maximum elevation towards this. That's now a concept you know well, but you see at some point, the, steady, the, the elevation doesn't change anymore, only very slightly, okay? And the elevation, the mean elevation is 1.52 centimeter. So you see it's a very small mountain range. The 1.5 centimeter hour. And the rainfall rate is 137 uh, millimeter per hour. So at some point we have 1.5 of erosion. Okay, so this is a very fast erosion rate if it was nature. Okay, we don't have we, we, we don't even have this per year uh, in nature, except in, in exceptional cases. So this is very fast, but this is, this is a small model. Now in this geology, they, uh, you know, they, they introduced the paper with the Mona paper, chicken and egg. What, what are the differences when climate drives tectonic uplift and when tectonic uplift uh, drives climate and topography. What are the differences? How can we distinguish the tonic and climate? And I think the, the experiments are really uh, super important. So I can only advise you to get this paper and I can send it. I can share. Um, they have constant uplift rate and variable rainfall. So when they say Variable rainfall is that they may fall perturbation, which would amount to a climate change. And what you see here is again with time, elevation and denudation rate, both are important and different. If you look at what happens, they have a, a rainfall rate of 100 something, 180, and they decrease when well, they, they reach steady state first. So that here they are in a steady state of elevation. So they are somewhere here and they, they decrease rainfall 
uh, 80, so half of the rainfall rate. So they go to a less erosive climate. And what happens, there is an instant reaction and topography increases. Okay. Um, I just left a couple of seconds of silence. I think it's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily intuitive that as soon as you have you, you change climate, your mountain range might start to grow if you decrease climate efficiency. So, so that's what they show here. And the, so that will be the, the, the range start, this, this silica, silicon, silica um, pate starts to grow in elevation from one centimeter of uh, mean elevation to 1.6. And it grows progressively, so there is a certain time for growth, but then it reaches a new steady state. Okay, so it's going to grow in height and get it to a new steady state in equilibrium with the new rainfall rate. Okay, now what's really uh, interesting is denudation rate. What do you think? Let me ask a question and try to. We know what you think by string. What do you is the flux out of the mountain here? Is it larger, similar, or smaller than the flux out of the mountain? Yeah. Well, if we go by the denudation rate, it's it's actually the same. Yes. Okay. At least after stays. Because, but but why is it the same? What sets the flux and the denudation rate? The uplift rate the uplift rate exactly so during climate change your topography grows and your flux decreases because if the mountain range grows less sediment less rock get out of the mountain okay when topography grows less rock get out of the mountain when topography declines more rock go out of the mountain if it's climate driving erosion. But the uplift remains the same. So some of the uplift in this, in this uh, transient, that's also an adjective that you should know is the word transient, the adjective transient. In this transient state, topography is growing. So some of the uplift rate is used to grow topography. But then here you, you come back to the same equilibrium as before between uplift and erosion. So erosion and uplift come back to the same value, OK? So despite the class is different, erosion is the same, and uh, uplift didn't change. And they are both of the same uh, value. It's a little bit counterintuitive, because you think with a different climate, erosion is now different. But erosion rate is the same. Only the landscape is different. And OK. So what types of uh, mechanical weathering, you know, I don't I mean so, transports. So weathering, there, there wouldn't be weathering here. Okay. So we wouldn't call it weathering. I think, uh, mechanical I think you would use weathering for the, for the transformation of, of, of minerals and rocks. Yeah. Um, to some extent here, you could speak about some sort of weathering when you, when you, when you think about the, changing the humidity of your, of your polyenol, it's completely homogeneous. Um, however, about sediment transport, I would, I would have a hard time answering you, but when you look at the piles here, you know, it's so small and it's, it's, um, it's difficult to say whether we are stream power or what, what exactly is the, the, the type of erosion that, that takes place. Um, so, so these, again, these are experiments that has, have to be taken at face value, not, they shouldn't be compared, uh, on all aspects with reality. They, they just give you a qualitative, uh, understanding of what may be happening in nature. Okay. I think it's a little bit the same with numerical experiments actually. And so. But, but small, for, for physical experiments, if you, I remember speaking about this with Chris Paula, and Chris Paula always says, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, that uh, 
the, the what what he studies are small rivers in laboratories, and then he tries to use that understanding to understand real rivers. But uh, he's not making a direct comparison between small rivers in the lab. Uh, studied here is a 20 centimeter by 50 centimeter silica putty under a fog, in a fog box. But still, we can take that analogy uh, and try to, to use it for understanding what happens in nature or the qualitative difference between, between tectonic change. Okay. That was just that, that I was thinking okay. about. Uh how precipitation could well different erosion mechanisms and uh, how that would be, how that would show in a graph like that of the denudation rate. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's a question. And, and uh, the problem is, uh, is the size. I mean, that's why I mentioned the size of the droplets because um, if you make a scaling ratio uh, drop, it's like if you had trucks of water dropping on the ground you know in terms of size even if even the smallest they manage to make here yeah, they are so sometimes they don't even fall you know they stay in that's why it's a fog box rather than a rain box uh, they are so small that uh, even if there is no wind in that fog, fog box turbulence and some of them do not fall on the ground uh, and stay in suspension still if you look at the scale if you imagine this is a a 200 kilometer wide mountain range or long mountain range or 100 kilometers here. The size of if you have trucks of water and not drop of water uh, when it's raining. So, so there is a lot of, of, those, uh, of those effects uh, that, that makes scaling is very scaling. Those physical experiments is very difficult. When I say scaling is putting them down to the scale of nature is very difficult. Same thing for river models, because the sound we use in river models is the same size of sound as there are there is in nature. When we do flume experiments, our sound grains are like a little truck of rock uh, rolling uh, on the bedrock. OK. OK, in the second experiment, um, what you see is here is a uh, rainfall is and at time 300 here, 350. So they are at steady state at touch, they uh, increase uplift rate here. They go from one to 1.5. And what something that looks like this, uh, it looks like topography starts it, it doesn't look like it. So we, we can see increasing. So you switch from something like 1.1 to 2 centimeter of me. Your mountain range also grows with uh, increased uplift. But the response in terms of flux is different uh, in terms of rotation. What you have here is you have a slow um, increase in denudation. Here you have a decrease in denudation, and so it is in flood mountain. Here you have a slow increase in denudation towards a new denudation rate, which is going to be a new flux than in the previous uh, steady state situation. So what I'm taking out of there, the the response to tectonic is slower. That's that's uh, that's one in terms of elevation, and perhaps also in terms of uh, elevation. And this is because when you change uplift, you have to elevation from the side of the model towards the inside of the model. Just, uh, just, uh, just to explain this differently, if, if you step on the Mont Blanc, for instance, on top of Central Europe, and uplift changes from one, two millimeters per year, you, you don't feel anything. 
you know you, you do not feel you're going higher and faster uh, however it starts raining raining and snowing twice more you see it so the difference between an uplift the change in uplift rate and a change in climate is that the change in climate affects impacts the whole landscape everywhere at once everywhere at the same time whereas a change in uplift is like a it has to propagate from here towards the inside. And you, you probably have seen that with nick point propagation, you know? Whereas a change uplift in a climate does not do nick point propagation, or it does a, some sort of different nick point propagation. So that one, and the second, this, so the first one is, is a difference in qualitative reaction time to, to the perturbation. And the second, I think, uh, major point is the opposite reaction in terms of flux. When topography increases due to climate, it's because climate becomes less of flux out of your mountain. When topography increases due to tectonics, you have an increase in flux. So as a sedimentary geologist, if you measure volumes, you know, when you see an increase in volume, if you want to explain it by tectonics, it has to be an increase in convergence and uplift. If you want to increase, if you want to explain it with climate, it has to be a decrease in climate efficiency. Okay. Uh, sorry, an increase in climate efficiency. If if you see an increase in on, on flux, but um, topography. Let's say you are uh, in paleo elevation, like we did for the Pyrenees. If you see an increase in topography, if it's climate, it should be associated with a decrease in flux. If it's technically associated with so I don't know if this leaves you perplexed, but uh, perhaps you can uh, you can uh, we we can, you can do that uh, with Fastcape to test it, um, and also read the read this paper again. But I think this is a uh, um, one of the major of this uh, of this paper that. I think uh, you should consider. Sebastian, I have a question. Yes. Yes, Esteban. Yes. So in this, this article, here in the area, assuming the climate main, let's say, impact is given by rainfall. But yes. could any of these response vary depending on other climate factors, let's say pressure, humidity, and so on? Be sure, because, sure. Uh, I guess I guess I guess so. Uh, I guess I, I, they didn't they didn't study that, but basically, I would say here uh, this decreased rainfall rate here is completely dominating the erosional efficiency of the landscape. But what what counts is the erosional efficiency. Uh, so any so let's say you have a function that describes erosional efficiency as a function of rainfall, temperature, pressure, any factor that will change and will decrease erosional efficiency would have this effect. For instance, it could be going from, uh, look at this, it could be going from here, I'm eroding the cover, and here I'm tapping into gneisses. You know, and it makes sense to, let's say you erode soft rock at the beginning, and suddenly you have more hard rocks at the surface. What will happen? Your topography will increase, okay? Because rocks are harder to erode. Your flux will decrease, okay? So when you exhume harder rocks, you have the same effect. This, this is an experiment on erosional efficiency. And this is an experiment on uh, the rate of rock uplift and tectonics. So, so I, I totally think you are right in pointing this out, is that any change in erosional efficiency that, that would have a different effect, like temperature change, the, the chemical ring of the rocks, uh, and let's say everything else is constant and you go to a less uh, weathering and less prone to erosion, uh, then you have this effect. Okay. Yeah, another small question. During yes. the increase of uplift, uh, mm -hmm. topography also increases. 
you would see a change in slope as well, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. In particular, because you know, another boundary, another limit of this experiment is that it's fixed in size. Okay, something that tested differently with free moving boundaries. Okay. Okay. When 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 this is fixed, in size, if you increase elevation, you increase okay. slope. Yeah. Okay. If uh, maybe it's not always the, the case in nature, maybe in nature you could maintain more slopes and increase ex expand your wedge laterally, you know, by in sequence truss propagation outward of the origin towards the external zones. I guess I guess this is where modeling is necessary because probably probably critical wedges expand and grow laterally um it the, the, i mean what determines whether they expand and grow laterally is actually erosion as well not only tectonics but the balance between erosion and and, uh, and uplift if if um, if erosion is really fast and your slope can be maintained then your wedge is not going to grow but if erosion slope starts to increase then the wedge is going to expand laterally to to re-establish slope there is a great panorama that uh, Luis and Miguel and Marta uh, know in in, uh, in the Pyrenees uh, when you are in the tower of Via Camp and Alex knows that as, as well, and where you can see a huge unconformity in the landscape, and you can actually maybe discuss that. You can you can maybe think about uh, you know the, the reactivation of the internal zones and and kind of changes in the slope of the or orogenic wedge, uh, maybe due to uh, to a decrease of the of the general slopes due to sedimentation in this case and not erosion. So, so this we can actually see on the field. I would really love to, to show this to, uh, to Jean, for instance, uh, uh, because this, this is really on the good, good point. OK, very cool. OK, here I, I switched to, to this paper in uh, 2001 by uh, when he was at MIT, now he's in uh, Arizona. Uh, and and you can see classic. I would read the whole collection of their works. Uh, you know, it's like uh, Victor Hugo when you're in the in high school, or if you're in Britain. But uh, these are these are classical authors of of this literature. So you can you can read all of their papers, and and you will you will find the diff different aspects of what they they work. Um, but here Whipple does. A bit of a similar study than that. He um, said that's a bit the thing we are looking at. There is a this is a longitudinal profile concave with an initial state, okay. and we perturb the system and we go to a new steady state. Okay, this will be the situation here, for instance. Uh, those cases you go from an initial let's say you can make a profile along this river at state one it will be this profile. and in this numeric sorry this is a numerical experiment at this uh, at, at uh, this new steady state this will be your new steady state with a high elevation but case of a taiwan style origin with a, a catchment of about 25 kilometers long and an elevation, final elevation of the of the divide at four 3.5 kilometer here. Okay, so we have this at and uh, what uh, what we look at is the response time as a function of different changes and the changes that we look at here are uf divided by ui. That's a chain uplift and little i for initial. So the fractional change in uplift, fu, is the ratio between final uplift of initial uplift. So here, for instance, one means there is no change. Here means um, 10 times 
increase in uplift. And this is 10 times decrease in uplift. Okay. And basically power low, so a stream power profile like this, and how much time it takes to reach steady state with different ends uh, on the um, slope uh, on the slope member of the stream power law. And so this, this, this paper is very interesting because here we can see that when you increase uplift, um, different, depending on the behavior, um, you will decrease, if n equals two, you will decrease response time. If n is less than one, you will increase response time. If n equals one, response time is the same to an, an, an increase or a decrease in, uh, in uplift, okay? In this case, uh, you know, the response time of such a catchment is always at least of, a, of the order of 100 or 200,000 years, potentially for millions to a change in uplift. Now, let's go to let's go to climate. This is C. C is a change climate, or like we discussed with Esteban, it's a it, it's a change, especially here of K. So it could be also a change in the erodibility of rocks, a change in temperature, whatever can would act on erosional efficiency. So we have a, K final A in each means at time at, at, at uh, the, the there is no time here sorry but uh, on this axis uh, but it means that at the perturbation we, we go to state and at some point we change erosional efficiency so this is a decrease in erosional efficiency and this is an increase in erosional efficiency let's say a twice more erosional climate and you see the 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 system the attitude of the curves is very uh, different for n equal to, but in general, when you have a, an increase in erosional efficiency, you decrease response time. And this makes sense. If you go to a more erosive climate, more erosive rocks, your response is faster. So I think it does make full, full sense. And all in all, and actually the company, when you go to a more erosive, uh, less erosive climate or less erosive rocks, your, your response is, um, is uh, much longer. Okay, and here end up with very long response time when you go to a less erosive system and we have very short response time when it goes to highly erosive system. What we can expect from, from that is, is a very responsive, very reactive behavior, more reactive than here in general, because we will always be reacting quite quickly to, uh, to climate, for instance, climate uh, perturbations, like cyclic climate perturbations. The response is going to be complicated as we oscillate between more erosive climate and less erosive climate. Now, this is the case where we have a functional change in uplift with uh, um, and a fractional change in Erosivity. So the flow change in uplift, and here we study a range of fractional change in erosivity, and we get down to very uh, combined FK of U equal two, so the doubling in uplift rate with different changes in uh, climate, and we go to very long, uh, very short response time to very long response time. Here, we increase tectonics and we double climate. So the system responds really fast because this goes towards an increase of slopes. So erosion is really maximized. And to this side of the diagram, we and we decrease the erosional efficiency. So your mountain is growing high, but there's no water to erode it. So the time scale for propagating the knee point is super long. Okay, so to me, the and and there is no. Uh, I didn't show what uh, what can be seen in the new day, but I think the combination of those two is uh, is important in saying the qualitative difference in 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 response of topography to climate 
Um, topography grows when climate becomes less erosional. Topography grows when when increases, and flux decreases when it's when when topographic growth is due to climate. And flux decrease uh, uh, sorry flux decreases when topographic growth is due to climate uh, becoming less erosive, and flux increases when topography grows as a reaction to increased tectonic uplift. Okay, this is just what you can do exactly in terms of sediment flux. Uh, when you change uplift, so that's that's what is not shown in this. That would be for uh, F equals two. And here I think I have N equals one. Um, and I change, uh, so I just change it. And in the other case, I just double climate. And what you see in terms of sediment flux are longitudinal file with is that you slowly increase sediment flux and you go to a new flux. So your stem delivers more sediment at the end when you reach a new steady state. It's also a small mountain range, exactly the same size as the one of, uh, of Whipple. I just took the same equation and the same setting. And this is when you double rainfall at one million year. So after at steady state, you double rainfall. So you double erosion. What happens is a, is a spike in, sorry, it's a spike in sediment flux. Because suddenly your, your, your river system has high slopes and suddenly it starts transporting. It's, it has a much more, much more water to erode. And there's a spike in flux that then decreases as you go back to the same steady state as before. Okay, so it's the contrary to this one. Okay, here was a decrease of rainfall. Here I do an increase in rainfall. Boom. So we can expect climate cycles, I think, to have a very strong response uh, to trigger a very strong response of, uh, of um, uh, fluvial systems in terms of flux, but very discrete in time. Will we see it? You know, the magnitude of the climate change, will we see that? Or is it going to be too brief? Is it going to be, uh, you know, uh, swamped into the average and the coming up of, of the mountain? And if there are you can see that from that if there are flux uh, perturbation in your mountain range, this will increase sediment flux, but only if the perturbation is long enough pressed in your sedimentary basin. Okay, if you double uplift at one million year, okay, but 1.2, you come back to the uplift you had before then, of course, you only see just a very little part of that permission. You don't have time to reach steady state. So you never are in, in full equilibrium with the new uh, uplift rate. And you see only a, a very small perturbation. OK, so any time here in between, the flux out of the mountain is not in equilibrium with the new uplift. And see, it's really hard if you measure fluxes out of a mountain range here to say anything about anything about the, the real tectonic uplift of that mountain. It would be a mistake to say uh, that you, you, you can just convert and, and assume erosion is equal to uplift. Okay? okay. All right, this is... Um, So here, I, I just wanted to perhaps try. Uh, this is a this is a yeah. um, to try to summarize this in a in a in a graphic way uh, again qualitative. I have a, I'm looking source segment of my source to sink system. 
Um, I have an uplift, I have a mountain range, I have uh, climate, precipitation, flux out of the mountain. And my question is, how can I relate flux to climate and tectonics? I think I've, we take from um, experiments, whether they are numerical or analog, and what we know from natural system is that the response time of origins to climate is not million and potentially even faster, maybe less than 100,000 years, maybe, maybe 20 kilo years, maybe even less. Okay. We don't really know, but the hypothesis that we have at the moment and still needs to be tested is that ranges are reactive to climate. Bedrock, river profiles, erosional, detachment limited, or even mixed, but those kind of um, steep uh, river profiles in mountains are reactive to climate. Now, here I tried to, um, to, uh, to change the uh, climate perturbations. And here in this part, it's more uplift. Uh, perturbations. And so I'm going to, it's going to be repeating a bit what I just uh, said from, from the papers, but here I have time and here I have different things on that. Topography uh, uh, in blue, flux in, in red, and rainfall in, uh, in black. So when I change, when I increase rainfall, the flux but then I come back to the same erosion equal uplift. My uplift is constant. And that's when perturbation time scale is much smaller than the equilibrium time of my uh, mountain or, um, or actually because the time is actually small. Okay. Here, I, and so if it decreased, Okay, if I have an increase in climate. So topography goes down, flux goes up transiently. It is a long term perturbation of climate. And this is, for me, I still have troubles with that, but this is to some extent counterintuitive. I know, for instance, uh, no problem with that. Um, but here, what you see is a slow change in climate towards, let's say, more erosive, so more rainfall, and then less rainfall. Let's say this is the Cenozoic curve. Okay, you're going towards early Eocene climatic optimum, and then going back, going to normal, to the to cold, colder climate of the Eocene. What you would see in your mountain range, if uplift is constant, would be a decrease in topography Constant topography. So you could slowly decrease and increase topography just because of climate. Okay, according to that, Since this is you know change of climate here. You could discretize this as a step of very brief uh, staircase step changes of climate. If you would do a model, actually, that's what you would do. You would have a time step, and you would say, okay, at every time time step, I, I just increase very very little erosivity and that results in a in a many many uh, in many many little uh, uh, changes of that type created is is a is a slow and and proportional decrease in topography and then back to an increase in topography and would remain constant so i think that's for me really um super interesting because you you measure flux in a mountain range in the fallen basin and you see no change through the whole cenozoic you see change in flux uh if 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 the change is if the flux if the climate change is slow enough you would see no change in flux out of your mountain let's say uplift is constant huh? your mountain could uh, evolve in topography and you would see no change in flux 
Um, so I'm trying to motivate John to, uh, to, to, to write a paper on this because he did some experiment uh, on that. But, uh, but I think this is, uh, this is really cool. And, and here would be some kind of uh, cyclic uh, changes. Uh, where flux follow uh, topography if my time scale uh, of change is very small. So let's say I do climate change I in that situation uh, many times. Topography will decrease every time I increase um, uh, discharge uh, and increase every time I increase uh, discharge, but on a very short uh, time scale. Sorry, Seb, may, may I uh, make a, a fast question, perhaps? Yes, for yes. you and also for Cecilia. It's uh, in terms of sequence strat, how the last scenario will look, look like? Like where you would have the transgressive surfaces and so on. It's, it's a bit complicated, maybe for now. No, it, I think it, it will depend. I mean, in terms of sequence at least in the marine domain. Let's say these are climate cycles of you know, uh, precession, eccentricity, obliquity, whatever. They would probably be accompanied by sea level cycles. Okay, so uh, let's say, and let's say there is no transfer zone that buffers any of this. This is what gets south of the mountain. Okay. Potentially, this is more rainfall. Let's say this is, we are in the late Cenozoic. This will be with an increase in sea level because when, when there is more rainfall in them, you are in a warmer climate and you have less water in the, in the, you have less water preserved as ice. So you would increase flux at the same time as you increase level. What would that give? would depend on the rate at which you increase sediment supply and the rate at which you change sea level, so accommodate. So it's the A over S ratio that would govern that. And so this you would probably call help Jean or Dionysos or a numerical model. Uh, just conceptually would be hard because, because you know, it's, it's a ratio of magnitude of changes. Uh, but, but I think that's, that's, that's an ex uh, excellent question. And so, is simplified here. What would be, there could be some delays. Uh, also here, when climate declines, I, I've put a, a proposed decline in flux. Maybe this decline in flux doesn't look like this, but it's, it's much more abrupt. Uh, so as you know, in Roda, for instance, during the hyperthermals, I am arguing that Potentially, these flux-driven sequences they 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 look uh, the same as base-level-driven sequences, but uh, but they are actually completely opposite. And when sea level is high, that's when we have proper progradation. And when sea level is low, that's our maximum flooding surface. We can discuss. I hope to discuss that in front of the the outcrop. Hopefully. But yeah, that's a, really the I think one of the main problems that uh, you guys should be studying and, and that new people in, in the industry, for instance, and those people who do sequence stratigraphy should, should, should look like, should look at, uh, is get out of uh, the old vision that base level is controlling and flux is changing. You know, for sequence stratigraphy, I'm a big fan of A over S, uh, but I, I was uh, I always in mind uh, what uh, Phil Allen said about sequence stratigraphy. He said it's been abs it's absolutely useless. So so he he was one of the thinkers about that, uh, and and it's just uh, again it has to be taken at face value and not like the Bible because uh, that's just his opinion. Uh, it doesn't mean it's right. Uh, you know you don't do uh, name calling. But uh, his, his, uh, his view on, on sequence strat is that uh, uh, the use of accommodation would uh, kind of uh, would be a diversion from really thinking about processes uh, because you lump different things into uh, non-physical. Like I said, accommodation is not a physical parameter, 
uh, it's a combination of parameters. And and Phil Allen was uh, was always uh, saying this that it's taken sedimentology away from thinking about physical processes. And I can I can see his point, uh, but I remain a big fan of it. And it's a beautiful theory, and I think it's uh, super cool for didactically uh, teaching sequence stratigraphy, for instance, and understanding of the first order what you see in the. Like Cecil said, it's what you see, uh, what you see in 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 sequences, and how you can make sequences speak about uh, A over S. Yeah, it, it is a methodology to describe the describe, yeah. record. But there is not an answer to the processes which were which are recorded in the sedimentary. So it is why we develop so, with Jean some Jean develop all the Bayesian uh, modeling to 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 try to to follow the mm -hmm. answer of this constraint from the source to the sink. But the sequence yeah. can't can't, dis, can't uh, do that. But it's the only way to describe. So, the natural yeah, I think I think I think Philip. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what Alan did like at all when people basically abandoned all thought about what was actually going on in catchments or at a continental scale in terms of sediments and only thought about a sequence stratigraphic framework with zero insights into what's going on. And of course, that's not actually how the approach should be used no, no. at all. Seals just you can describe what's there and it's super powerful in that that regard. I think my my impression from being to a few conferences with Phil is that I guess I think you just saw a lot of bad incidents that were not yes. not at the apex of mm -hmm. thought. Yeah. But it's it's um I think you the ESRs, you guys are the new the generation that should integrate this because uh, we, like Cecile, myself, we, we were already in sequence strategy and not thinking much about what happens upstream. Now we do, uh, but a bit late. Uh, and somebody like Phil Allen will actually concentrate on, on processes. Uh, I mean, he did so many papers describing succession without doing sequence strategy. And, and in a way, um, I think you guys can do both uh, to be augmented. You know, like we say, augmented reality nowadays. Uh, it's not something I'm a big fan of because I prefer to look at landscapes with my eyes rather than through a screen. But uh, uh, you guys can be augmented sequence stratigraphers, augmented uh, geomorphologists. A lot of geomorphologists past didn't look at the at all. So mm -hmm. as um, yeah, as blind as sedimentologists wouldn't look at the geomorphology. Yeah. Uh, and, and you guys can be both more uh, than, than in the past uh, we used to be. I, I so I, I remember speaking to when I first started my PhD, and I was I was chatting to Greg Tucker, who produced a lot of work with Kellen Whipple, and I remember asking him about sediment in one of his early uh, evolution models, and he just told me it got washed off. <laughs> <laughs> it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true that the first model, nobody cared about any any uh, sediment. It was just uh, they wouldn't even measure it. <laughs> this is true. Okay, okay. I just have five minutes before the break, and that's good. Um, here is pegs, and I think we've sorry we've seen that. Uh, it's it takes longer time so and and the sense the, the sign um, topography flux and tectonics go with the same sign if you want if you want to have a nemo a nemo technique things increase in climate is a plus and it it creates a decrease in topography. So climate is plus minus. Tectonics is plus plus because increase in tectonics creates a plus in topography and a plus in flux. Okay, so you see an uplift from U1 to U2 and you go, your flux increases towards a new steady state where U equals E and topography as well. There's no vertical scale. 
and the TX is long. So short time, so in this case, you have time enough to reach a new stage. I mean, so that's what I was speaking before about is that if your change in tectonics is, is, is too fast, you don't see a proper sediment flux. So if you're in the base in measuring flux and you measure that value here, you will have a hard time with two senses equivalent to tectonic uplift. If you are here, however, your flux and your uplift are the same. Okay, so this difference is between flux and exhumation rates. You know, often as a source to sinker, you will do a budget of flux in your do a budget of sediment volumes, and you have you have thermo uh, thermo chronologies giving you exhumation rates uh, in the in the, uh, in the drainage area in the source, and you can extrapolate. You can say, oh my my drainage area at the time was six thousand kilometers square. Okay, you have denudation rate. You can extrapolate a flux. And, 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 and uh, out and, and you see it does match it doesn't match uh, it doesn't match with your with the flux you measure in the basin well you have to ask yourself whether it's because you were or not at steady state if you were not at steady state there is no reason that the flux out of your basin is just equal to your to the to the rock uplift okay so also be careful what what is given to you by uh, thermochronometry. Is it uh, is it really erosion rate or is it uh, just a cooling rate? How does that work? Um, and of course something here that is I think still has to fully be is the magnitude. And I put a big question mark because I haven't I did not give it enough but the magnitude of change. Here we focused on time because as stratigraphers, we always look, we have no access to magnitudes. Uh, the only thing we look at is time as stratigraphers. We have, usually we, we are on the field and we, we do not discuss about, we say, wow, there's a lot of sediment flux in this basin. Or why this is a, a strong, very fast formulation. There's only qualitative adjectives. And uh, none of us has, has ideas about the real rate except except vertical rates we don't mean much so the magnitudes have really still have to be uh, studied the, the the volume and uh, and um, and the climate I I now um, I now um, so we, we've done basically the source. Done those. I have the slides a bit uh, and not in the right order, but we, we've done the, the, some qualitative understanding of the source and, and I, you read that as well with Fastscape and you can, I think you should now have a good feeling about those, uh, those uh, not those process, but those videos. Um, here I want to study a little bit more about the response of the transfer sub subsystem or the transfer zone. And so in the transfer zone, one, one way actually I, I addressed that, that problem to a simple system where you have a, again our source area and we let's assume we have QS, a, a, a flux of sediment going out of source. And let's assume that because of what we've seen before, it can actually vary with time. Then we have a transfer system. And again, I will assume that transfer is the main process happening here. So it's not a mostly, it's not sink, but it's really just transferring sediment to a basin where there is probably the shoreline here. And you, let's say you do progradation, retrogradation, all in. Uh, patterns, all the stratigraphic patterns we can have here. The question is, is whether when various sediments gets out of the mountain, are these cycles transferred 
to the basin. And but there you did such kind of settings and you could actually see that some of them are transferred, but with a lot of delay. Okay. One, one uh, um, uh, simple, like uh, on the corner of the table way to add is the equivalent time of the transfer subsystem that you can see as L square over K, the efficiency of the transfer system. And so um, here I distinguish two types of signals because the equilibrium time here, as we already have discussed, um, it's a function of those two, uh, those two parameters. But K itself is a function of the water, for instance, or the size of the grains. You know, the efficiency, the efficiency of the system is a function of water discharge size, perhaps even flux. Uh, so, so you have to distinguish between for pure uh, tectonic change in the mountain that will create a pure QS signal. Let's assume with no change in grain size, but just an increase in flux or a decrease in flux without change in water discharge. And other signals in which climate in the mountain range drives fluxes, but that are accompanied by a, a change in water discharge. So this first case was a pure QS signal I've worked on that uh, back in the time, and, and I shouldn't show, you know, this old, uh, but uh, with a colleague uh, of mine in Rennes, um, we, 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 we use this value to look at your river systems, okay? So the length is easy to get for a natural river, but what you do for for k and i should have uh, written that but how can you assess the efficiency of a river to to transport sediment the way we did that uh, inspired by the work of metivier in particular um, francois metivier at the institute of physique du globe in paris uh, he he, um, he proposed he suggested that the, the efficiency of a river system, the diffusivity of a river system, can be assessed simply by looking at how much sediment flux this river transports and divided by its width and um, what was it? I think that's just the width. Uh, so in in the first uh, in the first oh. approach, so by the unit width because. Uh, Let's say if you compare two rivers uh, and, they, and you see they both transport uh, the same amount of sediment, um, but one is very narrow and the other one is very wide. I mean, the wide river, if everything else is, is the same, huh? water depth, etc., uh, and also in the slope. I should write that, sorry. This is badly organized, but do like this text box. I will go k equals. Oh, uh, we see the, your desk. I know, I know. I'm I'm coming. K equals QS divided by in brackets width times slope. I I come back with a okay and now okay. Efficiency is sediment discharge of a river divided by width time slope. Sorry, missing a bracket here. Um, about two rivers, they, are, they have everything exactly the same. Flux that they transport, uh, depth, slope. One is wide and the other one is narrow. The wide one has no merit in transporting that amount of sediment. So it's not efficient to do more, okay? If you're a big person, uh, you don't, you have no merit in transporting something uh, light. But if you're a baby, uh, then you have, you have a merit. So 
that's the width and same for the slope so on a on a narrow slope on a sorry on a on a small on, a, on a, the same amount as a high slope then uh, you are efficient so k would be large, would be large uh, if uh, very efficient if it transports a lot of sediment compared to another river comparatively uh, if it's low or if it has a low slope okay so these are parameters that we can look at for natural rivers and therefore we can estimate the TA and that's previous slide where we calculate the equilibrium time of uh, current rivers and I use the database that Niels ever during his thesis and what we find is for different river lengths going from uh, these are quite large rivers, but in relatively large rivers because these are the rivers that can feed a sedimentary basin. We don't really care about small rivers that do not feed a sedimentary basin. So those rivers that, that are uh, usually more than 300 kilometers. And the equilibrium time, as you can see, uh, so the rivers, and there is no, uh, there is no correlation between of, of equilibrium time with river length, even though uh, there is L square, but there is no relationship, direct relationship between because everywhere there is sediment flux changing and also width and slope. Okay, there are other factors than length. So it's dispersed. But what we can see is that a majority of rivers response to more than 100 kilo years. A large majority of response time bigger than 20 kilo years uh, and another majority is more 40 but all in all this gives you a little bit of the time scale of response of natural rivers okay so uh, and, and the longest ones would be really long response time even to the scale of sometimes a million years so the result uh, is that long versus short transfer subsystems have, have different uh, behaviors and long system may actually buffer sediment flux variations coming from the source area, whereas short systems, of course, are more reactive and are more efficient at transferring uh, sediment flux. And that's something you probably have seen with Jean's experiments, that if you look at a, a, a stratigraphic section close to the mountain range, uh, you don't see so much delay and you don't see so much difference between what gets out of the mountain and what you preserve in your in your succession. And if you go very far away from the mountain range, probably at some point what you see in your succession really has nothing to do anymore with what happens in the mountain range. So that's what I, I wrote here. If and, and this is when K does not change with time. So this is just for pure uh, sediment surface cycles. When I wrote this paper, I, I really didn't understand a lot of, of, uh, of climate and, and tectonics. So, so it's very imperfect and, and um, generalization in the paper are a bit uh, too broad compared to what I now learned about the, uh, those. So when you have, however, a climatic signal then, um, then I switch to a different paper, but then K can change. And as we have seen, when let's say you have an increased climate, an uh, climate efficiency, you go towards more humid climate. L doesn't change, but K will increase. If you increase K, your T increases. When when you change climate, you have a, a very fast response. Uh, to it in your river system. So I just can uh, do that very briefly. Oops, I lost. I really do lose, lose the, the mouse. I just go through a paper by on, on this. This is a paper in 2012, uh, more climate cycles to the sedimentary record. 
which is a conclusion which is relatively opposite to what I proposed in 2003. Okay. Uh, uh, even though we've been trying to be smart in writing it in, in a not too uh, uh, conflict way, conclusion this happens, you find things uh, with time uh, that are different. But here is the behavior that I want to, you to consider. In this numerical, what here is the slope of a river, a transfer subsystem. So here you receive QS and water discharge, and here it gets out. Uh, note that it's very small uh, river, okay? And the model here is a model similar to what Jean, uh, um, how did you call that uh, Jean? But it's erosion and deposition, uh, okay? The, the, the only difference I think is that uh, Gas did this model. He, he was dealing with, with the, the water flow uh, in, a, in a way with shorter equations. So maybe that is a different from what John does in his model. But here, what, what we did is changing water discharge with time. OK? Increasing water discharge. And so you have it here reading this way. Uh, how is this reading? No, this way, and then here, and then here, and then here, and then here. When here we are at steady state, uh, or anyway, we, that's where we start our experiment. When we decrease what is discharge, we keep the same sediment flux in the, in the system. Huh? When we decrease water discharge, the river starts aggrading. Okay. That's what we were discussing before. If you have less water to transport the same amount of sediment, the river cannot. So by dropping sediment, you naturally elevate the river bed. Okay. And Alex will speak to you about this a lot. This is called sediment extraction. I mean, if you drop some sediment here, you have less to drop downstream. So, so this is a simple mass balance. You just drop it. And because you have less to drop down, you, you just increase the slope naturally. There's nothing. Um, uh, it's just mass balance is even, uh, more than that physics of, of the increase in slope here. Uh, no mystery, I want to say. And as you continue decreasing water, this you drop even more upstream. So you actually increase the slope, okay? And it decreases uh, uh, downstream. You note a little bit of a strange shape here, because if you think about it, after you drop sediment, down there, you still have the same water running on a steep slope with no sediment to transport. You may actually erode okay? So your river is kind of dropping sediment and with no change, it, as water flows downstream, after it drops sediment, it has less sediment to transport, therefore it can, it can erode. And then it has sediment to transport. So, that's a process that is sometimes responsible of pools and riffles in, uh, in rivers. You see some undulation of the riverbed. And we see that a lot in braided rivers, for instance. You drop sediment at the river bar. Then you have less sediment to transport. And at the river confluence, you erode again. So you have a pool in which you can bath. And then you have too much sediment to transport for a given slope. You drop it in the next river bar. And progressively along a river, you have you have a series of bars and braids. Okay, this is just a one D model, but the behavior is is more or less there. And you see here, you see, there's a bit of a neat point here. There's actually erosion taking place. But now we have minimum water and maximum slope. And now at that we are going to increase water discharge. And when we increase water discharge here, what happens? The slope on which we the water flowing is very strong. Therefore, you combine more water discharge and the very slope capacity and transport capacity. So you start eroding this part and transporting it down. And in this model, uh, you know, you have to put scale. Huh? This is 0.5, this is 50 centimeter. Okay. 
and this is 100 meters. So that you will see a from sediment acting in your area. You wouldn't see, this looks a bit like uh, aggradation, progradation. Uh, it is in reality, but it's, it would just be a, a front uh, a sheet of, of sand prograding. And you erode here and you deposit down. Okay, and at the end, to increase the discharge, you continue back to over slope and transferring sediment down. Okay, so this is what happens in a cycle of what is charged in this sediment flux with time. This is the sediment flux at the inlet. Uh, the sediment flux at the outlet. Uh, sorry, I said sediment flux is not changing, but I think um, I'm not anymore with uh, its concentration that is fixed. And, or maybe this is uh, this is probably this chart. Um, no, no, no. Uh, sediment concentration is L constant. So sediment flux varies a little at okay? uh, the entrance because its uh, concentration is fixed. So water discharge change and sediment flux change. So there is a, the additional effect of sediment flux. What we find in this model is that water discharge has a much stronger effect than sediment flux. Anyway, what you see here is inlet, what happens at the input signal and the output signal, what we measure at the outlet. This is that when sediment flux here is exactly, it's, it's exactly the same curve as the water discharge because it's just varying as a function of um, just sediment flux is the, the product of concentration by water discharge and concentration is fixed. So what you see is a very strong peak in flux when water discharge increases, okay? Because you decrease slope, so you erode uh, this part in addition to what you bring in the system. So you have a big spike in flux. And then when you decrease water discharge, like here, it gets out of the system. If there is no deposition even after 80 meters. So nothing gets out. So the result of this simple input is a uh, output. You get a strong pulse of sediment out of the system and then nothing. And then a strong pulse and then nothing. So when nothing gets out, everything remains preserved in the river. And when water discharge increases, you bring out of your system with not only what what comes from the source area, but also what you just stored in the previous period. Okay, so as a result, you have a very non-linear behavior uh, and a very strong response of the river system to climate changes. Okay, uh, it's one of the paper in which I contributed and I, I, really, I really like it, I read this paper. Let me go back to, to this here. So that's what I wanted to figure out here is that the difference you have a signal and it's buffered, and here you have a signal and it's amplified, okay? Depending whether you change just QS or whether you have eros, ero, erosion, uh, erosion efficiency as well, okay? So these are two very different uh, behaviors. Um, so, so here, um, when we increase, um, this is flux out and this is flux in. When we increase, in this case, let's say we, we do, let's say these are fast variation. You increase flux in, you don't see much in flux out. Let's say now you do very long time scale variations. Uh, with, with a perturbation time scale longer than TIEC. When you will increase uh, in black flux in, you will also increase flux out because your river transmits uh, your, the flux in. And the slope will increase because you increase flux in, the slope will increase and then will decrease. Okay? This is a pure variation of sediment flux on a long time scale, on a short time scale. 
So buffed and non-buffered because we have long uh, time scale of perturbation. In this case, when you increase flooding and discharge, you have a very amplified uh, signal at the output in terms of flux out. But the slope will go. So when you increase flux out, it's when you decrease slope. Okay, so I think there's a whole reflection to this is that in terms of climate, slope and landscape go opposite with flux. And we've, we've seen that with the soil. If topography of the, of the source area increases due to climate, then flux decreases. And it's the same here. The flux, the sign of the slope change is negative. You decrease slope. And on the long term, uh, what will happen in this system is that if you increase only flux, your slope will decrease. Uh, sorry, this is a water discharge. If you do not change flux in, this will decrease the slope, but the flux out remains the same. In this case, the black line is water discharge, and, and I'm not in the same case with concentration uh, constant. Okay, I have no change in flux of sediment in, so the flux out remains the same. The change is its profile as a function of water discharge. I'm aware that perhaps this is a little bit uh, uh, confusing sometimes. It's not easy to, to explain. I hope you grab it, but otherwise I'm available to, uh, to, to discuss it again uh, one day or when you want. Uh, I just would like to go forward and I'm skipping this because this is something you can find in this paper that you have. It's Brian Romans put together with the help of a, of a few of us. And it's called environmental signal propagation in sedimentary systems across time scale. And reviews uh, paper. Um, what I can say here is that uh, you will see, uh, but there is tectonic signals, signals and photogenic signals, and it considers how they can be transmitted. But um, it should be uh, it should be looked eye. Uh, it's just the state of the art in 2016, uh, but it can be a good start to introduce problems and do introductions. Um, but it's not uh, it's not a definitive. Again, it's no Bible. The thing I would probably ask you to take care to take not care. But, uh, remember, is the word environmental signal. I think this word is important actually. Uh, this was coined by uh, more by uh, Doug Gerald Mack uh, in his paper with Chris Paula when they spoke about the shredding of environmental signals. Um, and this is a really cool paper by Doug Gerald Mack where he shows how the natural uh, internal dynamics of river systems or natural systems can actually shred to pieces, so, so destroy. Uh, signals. Uh, if I if I go back to this figure, for instance, if there was a signal river, the signal that comes in can be completely destroyed by the internal dynamics. Here we're speaking about meeting and reaction, but what the the other thing that could happen is that the internal dynamic completely destroyed the signal that comes in. You know, like this, uh, I don't know if you have this in your country, but in France, we have Canal Plus. Uh, it's, what, it's a TV channel uh, that you, you need a decoder to, uh, to look at. So if you pay the subscription, then, then you, you, get the, the, you, you can see what, what they speak about on TV. If you don't pay the subscription, you only see a, a, a very strange screen. You kind of distinguish a, a, some sort of image in the background, but both the sound and the image are completely shredded. The internal dynamics, there is a code in between that does that, that destroys the signal. Uh, and, and you need to, uh, so here it's a little bit the same. You need to find what's the key, uh, what's the key for decoding this internal dynamics in order to be ready to, to read the signal. But if, don't, if you don't have this key, and, and if the, the code, the, the internal dynamics of the system is too strong, maybe there is the potential that signal coming Area are destroyed by those uh, river systems. So, 
So that's, that's I think, uh, interesting. That's, that's both interesting, uh, what you said, but for the world, you use the word environmental signal. And for once, you know, they kind of introduced the environment into earth sciences uh, by saying this. And I don't think it was uh, wished or con consciously probably designed, but a lot of the earth sciences are not seen so well in terms of the environment. Uh, if you about the, the, the uh, basically the, the, you could think that earth science are going through some sort of crisis uh, with respect to funding and the oil. Uh, industry or the resource industry, as a matter of fact, I have colleagues in my section, for instance, that refuse to use the word resource uh, for the earth, for instance. And and I I do think they have a point that can be uh, discussed. Should uh, should the earth uh, be taken as a resource? Absolutely not. Uh, that I have no no answer uh, about. I'm just saying that you know this is. If you look at the definition of the environment, uh, it's probably different than what you think it is. Uh, and, and often you go back to a dictionary and look at that. But the environment is, is, is defined, it's a relative concept because it's defined, you, you know, we speak about our work environment or our living environment. The environment means just everything that is around you. Okay, in that respect, uh, if I think about a source to sink system like this one, the environment for the system is, includes the source area, climate and tectonics. So a tectonic change is an environmental signal for the source area and the transfer system and the basin. So, all these changes that we are looking at, uh, for instance, tectonics is not just the realm and the domain of uh, of um, metamorphic uh, petrologists and uh, tectonicians of mantle dynamics. You know, it's it's also the environment, the way the the surface of the Earth goes uh, at one millimeter per year is is also relevant for us to understand sediment flux. Okay, so these are the things to be taken from, from this paper and the, the Gerald Mack paper. And the Gerald Mack paper, I've, I figured this way, you have a signal coming in and then it goes across uh, a transfer system and it's destroyed. You don't recognize any of that. Okay. Uh, uh, and that's the end product. Uh, it's... it's uh, it's uh, destroyed by internal dynamics. Another way to see internal dynamics is when there is no signal coming in and you have signal at the outlet. So you see the opposite, the kind of mess that, that this can uh, impose onto stratigraphic interpretation. The question is, is whether this is true. Does that exist? Is this, is this significant enough to destroy signal? Or are we, perhaps we're just fine, perhaps Perhaps this is this is so small that it's 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 not it's not having any influence. And the same for the interloping. Perhaps it's so small that uh, that it's it's not relevant and it's uh, we we don't have to worry about it. So, but that's a question I think. Okay, I I would propose to do a very quick uh, gains and limitations of, of the source to sink approach. Um, in trying to to finish, um, and I have two parts: a strong improvement and questions in the of the of the previous kind of chapters. Uh, I think I have one. If you can okay. very quickly to yeah. the drawing, uh, to uh, to the drawing that you made uh, about the transfer. Yes, this, that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when the timing of perturbation is uh, a lot smaller than the slope will also accompany the 
rainfall increase in this case? Yeah, no change in rainfall. This is supposed to be just sediment flux. Sorry. Oh, oh okay. This is sediment flux oh, right. in. Okay, that's what I had. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, this is a, a pure QS signal. QS yeah. for me is, uh, is sediment flux. No, no, Feel no, like I get called it. it the okay. QS problem. Uh, famous proposal. So, so this is. This is just, I didn't, I didn't figure out the slope on this, but the slope will actually change accordingly, but perhaps not much. Okay. Okay. I have a question as well. Um, yes. You kind of ended on the note of how significant are these internal dynamics? And I was wondering if you could comment, has there been a lot of work um, in quantifying the internal dynamics and how significant these may be? It's at the moment. It's really at the moment. I mean, it's been a long time. Uh, I can show you. It's a long time. And uh, for me, one of them is the Humphrey paper. Yeah, this one. You see my name? Yes, I see it. Yeah. This is a really cool paper. Uh, Paul Eller, who, who is uh, unfortunately a few years ago, um, this is 1995 paper, and it's called Natural Oscillations in Coupled Geomorphic Systems. Energy for cyclic sedimentation. So uh, again, I think a great, uh, a great title. And um, I. There's this word here that maybe only the, the British uh, understand, but I really like this uh, this relation uh, of uh, single perturbations applied to natural systems. So ding ding ding, ding we just uh, you to, know to, to tintinabulate is to bell ring. Is to what? To bell to ring a bell. It's to ring to a bell. Tintinabulate. Yeah. So. Uh, this paper is, uh, I mean, it's a mix of uh, great writing and, and uh, super cool thinking. But they they add a model. It's just a numerical model. Q1, slope, uplift, dz over dt. Uh, you know, dz over dt equals u minus erosion. Uh, you have a mountain. And uh, there is a, a non-understandable diagram here, however. Uh, but uh, what they just show is that they coupling this constant, they end up with natural oscillations. Uh, and they, they call that tintinabulations. So 95. And um, this literature uh, has been growing on and on from, from there. Uh, and, and they were probably speaking this before. I see Paula here. Uh, normally, what, you sh what, what I should have done is, is look more into the initial references three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine references. Uh, if you work on autogenic dynamics today, you wouldn't have nine references and have much more. Yeah, so so actually uh, with uh, Joel Shangross and, uh, and a couple of other people, we published a paper on uh, communication uh, uh, science and environment. So I'll just, on uh, basically shaping of erosion landscapes by internal dynamics, I'll just into yeah because there is not only just rivers but also also landscapes uh as uh as addressed I that well. cool merci alex yeah there is i forgot that there is a big review just uh, out not so long ago actually we discussed it uh luis and the group Okay, uh, does that answer a little bit your, your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thanks so much. It's a fascinating topic. Okay, so two chapters here, a strong improvement in the ability to predict reservoir characteristics and better understand and predict the Earth system. And it's not exhaustive, okay? Um, there are much gains and limitations of the source to sink approach. Personally, I don't hide 
uh, the fact that, that I think is uh, actually exciting. Uh, you know, if you read a book or watch a good movie, you're just uh, intellectually happy. And that's sometimes a, a, a good just in itself. So when you get a better understanding of things, I think it's already, uh, it's already good. Um, here is uh, one of the, the old I, I use, but um, I just start again from, from uh, sequence stratigraphy. Um, a simple view, you know, uh, of the frame like we discussed before, for understanding the sedimentary record as a function of a certain set of forcing. Okay, with some um, some thing, some some things we can follow in sedimentary succession. It's like the short. Okay, going seaward and landward and seaward again. Uh, we can see that if we don't have a full section, we can see that in a vertical succession, we have shallowing upward, deepening upward, deepening upward, okay? And all put together, we open the sedimentary landscape, how it was moving around, okay? And sequence stratigraphy told us that this is a function of a level if you follow this line going increasing, uh, sorry, low and then high, and I get degradation, uh, but also subsidence because this can modify, this creates space in the first place, but this can modify accommodation and sediment input. And the arrow, you know, in the first papers of sequence stratigraphy was actually considered important. It's, it's only with, with um, Exxon uh, expertise realizing what is true is that sedimentary margins around the globe accumulate sedimentary accumulations around the globe, especially on passive margins. There is a good amount of things that you can correlate from one side of the ocean to the other side. So they that Eustace was was a major factor. And I think they, they had a good point. Probably they were relatively true about that. So to some this discovery and, and the establishment of, of um, your static charts kind of diverted people away from, from, from the reality of the complexity of the factors that influence sequence strat towards the main forcing factor being used. Probably sediment input is kind of constant. Uh, if you look at large accumulations fed by large rivers, from orogenic basins, it makes sense. Uplift is not changing much in a craton. Uh, the river are long, so I think it does actually. But it really just diverted away from peop uh, people and thinking that only Eustasy is important. And anyway, in this vision, sequence stratigraphy predicts the distribution of sediments in the basin, okay? So it tells you that sediment are preserved in the low stand, are preserved in the transgressive system tract. It tells you also uh, how much vo the, the distribution of the volume. So if you have a fixed volume coming in, it tells you that the volumes are here or are here. And it also tells you that you have kind of uh, deep water, deep sea lobes, um, uh, here you would have uh, barrier islands, here you have a fluvial system, so it tells you the nature of your deposits and their geometry. But what it tells nothing about is the volume coming in, the changes in volume coming in, and also the nature of what's coming in. Shale, sand, you know, it doesn't tell you what's coming in. It, does, it, it tells nothing about that. So, you know, it tells you, it tells you a lot of stuff, about sediments, but not about uh, how, how, how the sediment are, are coming in, actually. So that's why I think there is this need. So we have you as in artigraphers, subsidence, sea level changes, those factors. Um, if we are carbonatist, for instance, it's less, this is probably quite enough to understand the stratigraphic record in carbonates, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, clearly, 
so important and uplift climate, the behavior of the erosion zone, how this is transfers are producing here and then how this flux is transferred through the conveyor belt is important uh, for sequence stratigraphy as well. Sequence supply is the link to upstream environmental changes. So now, uh, this is something that we stratigraphers concerned about understanding the earth are concerned about because we want to understand stratigraphy uh, we know it's a record of earth history so we want to fully understand it to be able to say not only what happens here but also what happens here and what happens here so what happens in the whole system but also well, the society and companies have realized that the nature of what comes in is important for your predictions of reservoirs, for instance. Uh, and let's be open about it. Uh, if you are an oil geologist, um, whether your source area is bringing you shales only uh, is very relevant compared to if it's bringing you only uh, one millimeter diameter uh, sand for gravels or a mixture, okay? Then of course, the whole way sediment is distributed in the basin, uh, uh, the whole way all of these things are uh, arranged in the basin is important. Uh, but what you bring in, firstly, is fundamental. And also how much you bring and how it changes through time. Okay. Same thing for the gravel industry. Uh, if, you, if you are gravel, mining or roads uh, for construction, uh, you know, how did quaternary climate changes uh, modify the way gravels are rooted uh, in subsurface uh, modern or submodern systems? Uh, that's fully important and that's much less in conjunction with the source area and geomorphology than with base level change and subsidence at uh, classical sequence stratigraphic uh, timescapes. Okay, another aspect of that uh, is that sequence strategic up, and this is a paper by Tor Somme, who is also part of the, the network. And so I think their contribution is really interesting. Uh, Tor Somme did that during his PhD, I think, uh, and he this was more the applied uh, perspective or generally applied objectives. He worked with Ole Martinsen, who was chief geologist uh, in what was Hydro at the time, but it's now Equinor. William Helland Hansen, who is a numerical modeler. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm mistaken. Uh, he's a, no, a sedimentologist of source testing systems. Uh, but it did publish with numerical models of, of, uh, of stratigraphic uh, systems, a lot on diffusivity as well. And John Thurman, who is another uh, sedimentary geologist. And so Tor actually looked at the shape or, you know, the, um, the anatomy, the morphological parameters in source to sink systems. And why did he do that? We wanted to see whether there are rules and, and it's a bit like, um, you know, you go to the doctor to know if your kid are growing fine or not. You look at how uh, growth happens and there are kind of rules. Of course, we are all different, but there is kind of normal. And it doesn't mean that any sedimentary system looks like the normal. There is a big variation. But there are some extremes that are not possible. So it gives you bounds of the natural shape and dimensions of natural systems. So, for instance, I, I mean, I advise you to go and see this paper, but look at the length of submarine canyons, so canyons on the shelf, on the shelf and slope, there is versus fan volume. Okay, so you see a relationship. He actually uh, looked at the, the, the relationship here. And so why is this useful? It's because knowing one of the two parameters 
you can actually constrain the oven. And so with a lot of those things, you can actually do some predictions, you know, fan length and fan width, look at how well correlated they are, R equal 0.93, quite good. Much better than 0.32 here between width depth relationship of submarine canyon and fan volume. Uh, I because the problem also, uh, is a function of how much uh, sediment comes in in the first place. But, but these are very interesting for prediction, okay? Because often you do not have the whole basin. You have only some parts. So if you, if you can do, uh, you know, proximal relationships between the difference, uh, maybe you have information here, you have partial or parcellar uh, information from jumping from one system to another with those kind of relationships you can actually start to constrain and reconstruct to sync uh, system. And I think that's, that's a, a virtue, a virtue of, um, of uh, the source to sync. Another one I wanted to, uh, to speak about um, is, um, is the uh, uh, that, for instance, Phil Allen uh, took uh, already back in 2005 or six. Uh, Alex be part of that, uh, and and Phil Allen published, uh, yeah, about five or six years, seven years later, uh, a big theology paper. Not so easy to read, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> not super, it's not in the classical Allen, uh, easy to read, uh, maybe Allen is not always easy to read anyway, but, but um, it's a cool paper and, it, and it's um, really running on the Pyrenees, but basically this was uh, the fruit of a project uh, that uh, um, Allen and his group put together with Equinor. Uh, in 2006, uh, and which was called integrate setting uh, search uh, the 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 QS problem, and it was really centered on on the um, prediction of solid and 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 solute uh, fluxes that connect. You know, he was speaking a lot about teleconnections that connect the source and the basin. So basically, uh, it, it really made uh, um, the, the source to sink approach really unavoidable nowadays um, if you want to uh, accurately predict the lithology of reservoirs. You, you have to be worried about the source area. Of course, you know, a lot of oil and, and also sediment normal academics that work in sedimentary geology uh, in the 50s. A lot of people have done that before. I'm not saying uh, we, everybody here invented that, uh, but it was less framed and less, less, uh, less of a paradigm. For instance, I said at the beginning of this course that I will, I, I, I'm not covering the provenance aspect of source to sink uh, research. And it's true that uh, people like, uh, what's his name? Um, Dickinson, I think, uh, have, have uh, worked on provenance a lot since the, since a long time ago. So I'm not saying that no one before Phil Allen has worried about what comes out of source areas, but uh, there was a lot of uh, theoretical framework here being put together. So this is an example of, you know, a mountain range, which is the Pyrenees, uh, this activity, which is not only uplift, but also fold and trust. Uh, and there is a discharge here, something very important, the downwind finding grain sizes, how volumes uh, evolve, and also how, uh, you know, the flux is directed outside of the mountain range, but then blocked by the structure, diverted, and becomes longitudinal on its way to another basin, another sink somewhere else. It picks up new sediment, so there's a whole complexity of drainage and sediment dispersal in the basin, okay? And the tools that you can use are stratigraphy to reconstruct 
you can use chronometry to uh, reconstruct erosion rates and exhumation. You can also use a lot of uranium lead dating, but also the trital thermochronology to um, assess and evaluate the provenance and, and uh, you know, uh, reconstruction of drainage systems uh, and downstream finding. Alec can, can speak you, to you uh, days about that, but uh, it's a function of subsidence, it's a function of the PDF, of the input grain size, and I probably forget stuff, but uh, there's, there's of work you can do uh, with all of this. So I can only strongly um, advise you to, to look at those uh, papers because they are state of the art. Um, okay, it's, yeah, in particular, for instance, the, the thesis of uh, Nicolas now in industry. Uh, is, is a good set of papers. Of course, yeah, no, there's lots of uh, super cool papers by Amy on, on the Pyrenees and by John on Mont. Uh, Nicolas thesis. Uh, I think Alex uh, was involved actually heavily in uh, in writing those papers. Uh, there's a there's a there is a, a lot of really cool stuff on how to estimate sediment volumes along a sedimentary route routing system and and what are the controls on that okay uh, wait a second that's my almost last slide and i will be finished when i say better understand and predict the earth system i want to this lecture i i, I don't want to to take it much further than that but for instance um you know we we did this work on the ptm uh, and uh, yeah, the French radio, uh, as soon as we had this out, saying that what we did, for instance, in the, in the Pyrenees was to show, to calculate, to back fluxes of water. So reconstruct paleo hydrology, paleo precipitation, and paleo water discharge. One of the most extreme climate changes of the past. And of course, you know, uh, our calculations are, are um, have heavy uncertainties, okay? But it's not because we work with a very stratigraphic record that, we, that it should prevent us to do it because that's the only way I think that we can say something about the, the, the past. And one of the challenges is to really, I think, just tell the story that we can read. You know, each of you has, I think, uh, topics, PhD topics that will allow you to tell a story of what happened in the past. And those stories, I mean, my take on that, and there's a super cool paper by uh, Richard Pankost uh, in England on this. I really like this, this take on what we do. Um, the idea here is to just tell that story, you know, like I told you yesterday about uh, global warming. I'm not, I'm not into, uh, you know, uh, telling, telling you what is good and what is bad, for instance, or I'm not, I don't think we are here to tell the society uh, oil is bad or oil is good, you know. I, I just think we can, the story we can read in sediments and, and, and tell it to the society such that the society knows what can happen. Then the society is mature enough, should be mature enough, and, and democratic systems should be mature enough to decide based on those things. You know, it's like when you, when you have a decision to take, okay? You have to weigh things. Science shouldn't be the only, your only uh, cause in, in decision making. There are other important things. So, but our role and our knowledge and skills are there to, to at least make this effort to tell what happened. And so in the case of the PM, uh, we have to be honest as well. We don't really know the causes, but we see an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. We can see that this increase has warmed the earth, not everywhere in the same, in the same uh, rate, not everywhere to the same extent. But what we see in the Pyrenees is that it has also 
be accompanied by more extreme precipitation. Okay, we cannot say whether it was on average more rain, but we can say that there was more extreme seasonal events and more intense episode of water discharge. And so, that, you know, the, the warming is estimated to be five to eight degrees. And what we measured is that on average, the increase in sediment discharge and also in water discharge was about eight times uh, the, 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 the um, what was about a factor of eight, sorry, but it was before the PTM. So, but our uncertainty is big. Also, our lower bound is just 1.5 and our upper bound is 14 times. Well, but average, Salut, salut, François. Tu peux allumer le... Tu peux allumer le... François, on t'entend euh, par les cuisines. Uh, so, I... Uh, so, so, this is the... Um, this is one message we had about the, the link between the chain precipitation sediment transport to warming, which I think is an interesting link to, to make. And, and we, we've been very careful in saying this is what happened there at this place and what we read, the story we read here, you know, like journalists, you, 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 you go somewhere and, and, and you try to understand what's up, the narrative of that, uh, of that story. You don't necessarily have to, to tell your opinion about whether it's good or bad. Anyway, it's the past and that's what happened. Um, the other important thing, as, as far as uh, I, uh, geomorphology is concerned, is that what we could see is that in this example, the rivers became, the, the way the rivers adjusted to a massive increase of water discharge is not by incising. It's, it's and contrary to what I presented this morning, that when you increase water discharge, you erode. Here in this case, the, uh, the, the rivers became really wide. They, they enlarged massively. So my understanding of that is that uh, probably the floodplains became less vegetated, less cohesive, less stable. And the, there was an increase in mobility of the river system. And, and it's easier to erode the banks than to erode vertically. But this, necessarily, uh, this is not necessarily uh, something that we were expecting initially. Okay. So, so yeah, this, uh, I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finished, but I think it's important to have this, uh, this take home message that uh, we, can, we can, with a source to sink approach, uh, we can both have associated in impact on, on, on doing a better job and understanding um, the subsurface uh, economical uh, reservoirs. And sorry, I completely forgot to speak about CO2 storage. My first uh, slide here, you know, more and more uh, the, the nature of formation, which we are probably doomed to inject gas to save the atmosphere, the nature of, 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 of the lithical uh, and our understanding of subsurface reservoirs is fundamental for that. So we, we do not have need to understand subsurface to extract oil. We have to understand subsurface to put back all the CO2 that's in the atmosphere into those uh, reservoirs. And it's very different. Uh, if you put it back in a reservoir that has a lot of uh, mafi grains, or if you put it back in a reservoir that is uh, mainly um, non we with one parts, for instance. So the nature of the grains in which you inject uh, CO2 or anything else, uh, methane, for instance, is very uh, important. You could have unexpected behaviors, you know, uh, abiotic reaction between your, your grains and uh, your, uh, that creates something unwanted. So that's number one is economical aspects and important CO2 is economic and society, but also tell a story about our, our, the past 
of our Earth, which I think is no uh, to make uh, good informed decisions. Uh, but not my role to, to say what are good and, uh, and bad decisions. And so, conclusions. Uh, I think we've been through a lot. Um, I think one, one of the important things of the source to sink approach is the fact that causes and effects can be offset in and space. When I when I say this, I mean you you see something in your stratigraphic succession, you really do have to think outside of the box and think about the source area, which is spatial offset, offset and think about time offset. But what John demonstrated yesterday is that the flux increase you see in your succession might be related to a flux increase that happened 20,000 years before, uh, delays. Uh, difficult to have anticipations. Uh, you know, what looks like an anticipation uh, is not really a uh, sediment flux is, uh, is concerned. Uh, the source to sink approach, I think, triggers, uh, makes us think about climate much more than if we only look in the basin. You know, if you just look Let's say you're an oil geologist looking at turbidites. Um, you're below a thousand meters of water and you have lobe switching and about uh, the Bauma sequences or bypass. You don't necessarily think about climate, but climate could be responsible for what you're seeing in your basin. The absence of uh, sediment, for instance, or the supply of just shales. And that's going to completely transform your, the name of your local little uh, uh, sedimentary strata. It also makes us think about tectonics, of course. It's obvious also about so all of this is signals, and it makes us think in terms of signals. And we, <coughs> pardon. So in, clearly think in terms of systems, because. Uh, Thinking in terms of systems is the only way you can deal with signals, input, output, preservation, storage, internal dynamics. You have to kind of uh, think in terms of uh, have a systematic approach. Also, I think scales is a, is a major take of this uh, course I wanted to give because uh, the systematic approach and the signals are all dependent on and on uh, magnitude uh, numbers. So that's something I think we've covered uh, quite well. And so rate, and I should have dates and rates, which is also a mnemo, technique or, or some, some word that you can uh, remember. Date and rates for projects. Uh, it's, it's really important because uh, you know, age really, or date is really the, the key to cause and effect relationships. So for instance, the, the, what, again, what you've seen with Jean yesterday, these delays, these delays, you see them in a model. How would you prove those delays in a natural system? You would, okay, you would, you would need to date. Uh, without age control, Stratigraphy doesn't work, and geomorphology also doesn't work. Okay, so uh, we can only work with with uh, with age. It's really at the at the crucial point. So I know some some students of uh, of uh, of Francois recently, for instance, working in the Pyrenees, they have done what they call the bibliopaleontology. There be papers of uh, of uh, some paleontologists to really understand and reevaluate uh, all the ages given in the literature and all the even they, they went down to look at the at the little bugs little uh, little uh, animals that were dated to see how you know the the boundary between the nanoplankton zone eight and nanoplankton zone nine. Uh, what's the numerical age today of this uh, of this uh, of this boundary? 
You know, if you read a paper that was published in the 70s, the age of that boundary is not the same as the age uh, that it has today. So you, I, I would strongly advise you to, to always have, have this in mind, uh, to really put a lot of attention in putting numerical ages dating on the rocks. And, and that's why in, in the project, for instance, Miguel Garces is, is doing magnetostratigraphy. Um, and, and that's, that's really fundamental. Uh, if there's been so much progress in understanding source to sink systems in the Pyrenees, really thanks to good dating of, uh, of stratigraphic sections in the Pyrenees. Without those ages, none of the, none of the progress uh, that has been done in the Pyrenees will be, uh, will be doable. So, so that's, that's absolutely uh, key to, to, to understand uh, sediment uh, routing systems. And I think I could stop sharing 12 to 25. So uh, a bit five minutes in advance, I would have thought to, 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 to stop uh, a little bit before, but uh, in, in the end. So thank you. I think this is the end of my part of that uh, lecture. And I will send the PDF as soon as I have uh, time.